in Arizona for eight years. And then she was the botanist at Oregon Pipe National Monument for 19 years. After retiring in 2013, Sue co-authored The Flora of Southwestern Arizona with Richard Felger. And this publication is available online at the University of Arizona Herbarium website. Um, this time of the year, we all have wildflowers on our minds, as you can see from our conversation before we officially started the meeting. And as we know, their appearance is not a sure thing. Will the Sonoran Desert have a good wildflower season? Right now, unless we get some more rain, conditions do not look too favorable, but that could change. In the meantime, we can all see and enjoy some wildflowers in this presentation. Take a walk through the winter, spring annual plants with Sue. See some all-time favorites and also some unusual species. And as Lynn mentioned, think about your favorite spots for viewing the spring show. And at the end of Sue's talk, there will be some time to share. As always, please put your questions in the chat and we will also review those at the end of the program. And so Sue, we're ready to see your 400 plus slides. All right, thanks Susie. Let me see if I can do this right. <laughs> <laughs> we know you can. Success. Yay. All right. Do we have a go? It's a go. All right. Well, I saw a lot of familiar faces and names. Um, it's nice to see you again. Lots of new people too that I don't know. So um, this is gonna be fun. We're gonna just take a look at some, mostly just some old favorites um, because I haven't seen some of these in a while. Uh, it's been so dry and uh, it's just nice to look at pictures of flowers. Sometimes I just go to my computer and look at plant pictures just because. Um, so let me just say, why don't you pull your cursor down, your mouse down so your little arrow isn't in the screen. Thank you. Um, all right, so. I'm gonna start with a couple of slides that I call flower porn. Uh, and it's just these big expanses of wildflowers that we get every several years. And, and um, it's just gorgeous and the fragrance is lovely. And these are desert, these are um, poppies, Asoltia californica, uh, subspecies Mexicana at Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument. And it's a thrill when this happens. It's, it's really, really lovely, but it doesn't happen all the time. San Verbena makes these gorgeous displays too. And this is down in the, on the, uh, in the Gran Desierto. San Verbena is in the Nick Paginaceae. It's a Bronia villosa. And it will just absolutely carpet the dunes and paint the dunes a, a beautiful purple. This is kind of a, a lousy photo, but it's a, a photo taken uh, above the Gran Desierto looking at San Verbena, and it's spectacular. But you can also see these little local spots where you just have this nice little explosion of wildflowers, and you get to explore around these little nice spots. Um, because big displays don't happen every year. It's nice to just enjoy small ones. What do you need for one of these big, fancy um, flower porn years? Well, you need soaking regularly spaced rains that help to germinate the seeds. Rain, that rain needs to start in late October to November. Uh, and 
there really shouldn't be any hard freezes that is less than 25 degrees Fahrenheit for a good number of hours, or it'll kill the, uh, the germinating seeds and young seedlings. And uh, you need cool temperatures from November through February. What's been happening in the past 10 to 20 years is that we've had such warm winters and during those warm winters, we've had these periods where it's been very warm. And at least in the organ pipe area, we would have uh, these big die offs where we had all these wildflowers coming up. And then we'd have this long, dry, hot period and it would kill them all, uh, all the seedlings. And, and um, so with the onset and the progress of climate change, I think we're going to be seeing fewer and fewer of these big spectacular years because we're going to get le less rain in the winter and we're going to get warm, even warmer winters than we already have. So uh, if you get to see one of these winters, it's a wonderful thing and count yourself lucky. It's, it's wonderful. I've heard, I don't know how many people tell me that, um, oh, it's going to rain, and three days later, we'll have this carpet of wildflowers. It just doesn't work that way. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It takes a while for, for things to come about. Okay, one of my very first, uh, the very first things that I enjoy in the spring is in February when the desert mistletoe is blooming, February and into March uh, a little bit. The desert mistletoe is a parasite and it grows on trees, mostly in the legume family. Uh, it, it produces these tiny little flowers and these, these are pieces of the stem with the flowers on them. And those flowers produce a fragrance that is one of my top five desert fragrances. It's beautiful and it'll stop you in your tracks if you're walking along a trail and you smell that. Where's that fragrance coming from? It's desert mistletoe. And so then the flowers get germinated, uh, um, pollinated and they produce these bright red glossy fruits, which are the, one of the favorite foods of um, phenopeplas, which you see in the lower right of your screen, the uh, blackbird. And when phenopeplas eat the fruit, they poop it out on, on the stems of trees and those seeds germinate. And you can see in the central photograph there, a picture of, uh, it looks like an ironwood stem and the, uh, the mistletoe seeds in pale tan are germinating and going right into the, the wood of the tree. When they do that, what they're doing is they're, they are um, sharing the water that the tree provides. But since they're green, they can also photosynthesize. All right, so that's one of my favorites. And I already mentioned Crossosoma bigelovii. That's another very early bloomer. It's, it might even be done blooming by now but it has a lovely fragrance and you can find that growing on, it, it loves, like its name suggests, it grows on rock cliff faces and sometimes just in rocks, but you'll always see it hanging over a cliff like this one. Of course, we gotta mention Mexican poppy, a desert poppy. It's in the, it's a true poppy. And um, so it has four petals to the flower. And uh, you can see a cross section of the flower there on the left side. And you can also see the fruit in the center. And when the fruit matures, if you touch it when it's uh, dry and mature, it'll explode and then send these seeds out uh, across a small area and spread the seeds around that way. It's called explosive dehiscence. When a fruit opens that way, it explodes open and shoots the seeds out. But this is Mexican poppy 
is one of those that creates big, large displays during very good years. But I have been seeing it blooming around here. It's blooming in my yard right now, but it's only a couple of inches tall. It's kind of pathetic. In a good year, this could be you know, easily a foot high, foot and a half high, uh, and really showy. And like I said, it can produce these gorgeous big displays. The, as you can see on this slope, some parts of the slope are really showy and have a lot of flowers and other parts don't. And that has to do with the uh, nutrition, the, the soil and how much nitrogen and phosphorus is in the soil. Okay, desert lupin is another one of these uh, perennial favorite or annual perennial favorites. <laughs> and it scientific name is Lupinus sparsiflorus because it has relatively few flowers. It has, um, it's a true pea and you can see that the banner of a pea flower, which is uh, the top part of the pea flower, it turns pink when the flower is pollinated. And so what it's doing is it's sending signals to the bees that pollinate it, that this flower has been pollinated and has no nectar, but this other one with the yellow banner, that one you should go to and, and uh, get some nectar and, and in the meantime, pollinate me. So it's a nice signaling system. So we have three lupins that are common in the lower desert. This is one of them and it's probably, uh, maybe the most abundant one. And it, it, it makes these big displays. The second one is Arizona lupin. And this one is more fussy about its substrate. And it's a bit more kind of a rosy purple than the, the other the Lupinus sparsiflorus, which is bluish. This one is kind of a violet, lavender, sometimes lavender. But again, the banner is yellow when it's not pollinated and pink when it is. Um, the third lupin is Bahada lupin or Lupinus consinus. And it is this really low growing thing. And it has these really hairy leaves, kind of fuzzy look, appearance to it. And the fruits are fuzzy also. Um, Again, the banner turning colors when it's pollinated. You can, you can tell the difference between these species. If you look at the scans that I've done of the leaves, you can see Lupinus sparsiflorus has these really thin, narrow leaflets. Lupinus arizonicus has leaflets that are broad at the ends. Um, and Lupinus consinus, consinus oops, has very hairy leaves. And again, the Lupinus sparsiflorus has blue flowers. Arizonicus has pinkish lavender, plum colored flowers. And, and um, Lupinus consigna has pretty small flowers and they're pinkish lavender. So those are the three ones that we have in this local area that you should know if you wanna identify wildflowers. Another perennial favorite is owl's clover. It's in the oral bank KCE. These, um, are, these have a really interesting flower structure. And I think I, I think the next one shows the flower structure. Yeah, beautiful color. I, I call it Pepto-Bismol color. Castellate excerta. It used to be called Orthocarpus purpurea. So if you have old uh, wildflower books, that's the name and you'll find it under Orthocarpus purpurea. Now it's Castellate excerta. And when you look at a flower stalk like this, what you're really looking at are a bunch of flowers um, close together that are subtended or have a bract underneath the flower that looks like a petal sort of. And then, and then you'll find the calyx, which surrounds the flowers. The calyx also kind of looks like a petal and you see the uh, scan of that in the lower center of your screen. And then 
the flowers are really kind of weird looking. If you look at the upper right scan, you can see the stigma or the part of the flower that accepts the pollen. It kind of looks like an alien. <laughs> It really, castilea flowers are very interesting. But together, um, when it's mixed in with other things like poppies and bladder pod and lupins, the color combination is, is wonderful, I think. Bladder pod is really common and it seems to, it seems to survive, if there is a freeze, this will, the seedlings will survive a freeze with bladder pod. It's called bladder pod, Lescarella panella in the mustard family. And it has uh, spherical seeds that break open and they, and there's a, a load of little tiny red seeds in there. And they were an important food crop for the autumn people. Bladder pod is famous for creating flower porn photographs <laughs> or scenes that, that people will like taking photographs of. Uh, this is in the Sauceda Mountains in Western Pima County, uh, Maricopa County. Beautiful. Chia is a, another favorite. It is in the mint family, the Lamiaceae, Salvia columbaria. It's got blue flowers uh, and typical of plants in the mint family, it has a square stem and, and flowers in whorls like this uh, and a nice uh, a flower that has um, kind of a landing pad for pollinators. The leaves have, the veins in the leaves are embedded deeply. And that's an adaptation for moisture conservation. So that the low, very microclimate level, that plant is creating a higher humidity around that vein, um, or around that vascular tissue that uh, will exchange air uh, and if the veins are deep in tissue, then uh, it won't lose as much water from that tissue than it would otherwise. Scorpion weed is a fun plant if you're not sensitive to it. <laughs> it this is in the Boraginaceae. It's called Facelia crenulata, variety ambigua. It has, it's called scorpion weed because it has that curled tail and uh, or curled uh, inflorescence branch. And uh, it, this species is purple, maybe blue purple, sometimes rarely it's white and it kind of has dark green leaves, but it smells to high heaven. It smells really bad uh, and it has these stalked glands on the stem. You can see that in the scan in the center of the slide. There's little tiny stalked glands and those have um, a chemical in them that in 10% of the human population will cause a dermatitis. It's called scorpion weed dermatitis. Uh, and in good years, organ pipe, would in good wildflower years, we would get people coming into the visitor center with horrible rashes. Um, and th these rashes would be on their knees and shins and elbows. And you can tell that they had been down on the ground photographing scorpion weed and had gotten nailed by the by the material in these in these glands. So I I, I had a friend of mine who was hospitalized by by this dermatitis. So, all right, next slide. This is another, there's a whole lot of phacelias and sometimes they can be hard to tell apart. This one is a wild heliotrope, 
Facelia distans. And oftentimes this thing will be in big crowds of plants. Each individual plant is kind of scrawny, like you see in the upper left of the screen. But usually you find them in big crowds. And so they produce this beautiful kind of blue purple uh, grouping of plants that's really kind of distinctive. Um, these facilities have distinctive seed types and uh, you have to look at calices, the, the, the uh, part of the flower that's underneath the petals. You have to look, those are important for the identification of these species. Moving to the aster family, this is Raffineschia neo-Mexicana desert chicory. Um, and the, if those of you who are from the, the Northeast, Northeastern United States, you, the chicory there is a blue color, really pretty blue color. Here it's white, uh, and but same family and everything. And you can see composite flowers are called composite or aster fam, uh, flowers because they're composed of lots of little flowers or florets that you can see in the lower center of your screen. Um, those are individual florets that I've picked out of the larger flower. Um, and each one of those can be pollinated. And then the pollinated flowers produce seeds like you see in the upper center of your screen. They've got, um, yeah, anyway. And these can be carried by the wind. I don't know if you can see it, but this bee is stuck in the flower here. <laughs> Oops. This, uh, oh, never mind. Desert sunflower is this cheery yellow plant in the Asteraceae, Jerea canescens. It has kind of a silvery color to the, to the leaves and this bright, happy yellow with a kind of a yellow orange center to it. What makes it even prettier is that you usually find this on desert pavements, which are dark um, and don't have a lot of other things growing there. But this thing just stands out against the desert pavement. It's really beautiful. You can see, I, again, the little florets, the little, uh, the flowers in the center of this type of aster flower are called disc flowers. And you can see those in the center uh, bottom of your screen. And the flowers that are around the outside of the, the florets that are on the outside of the flower, you can see on the lower right of your screen. Sometimes ray flowers are sterile, sometimes they're not. And, um, but you can see the, the, the um, little florets in the center. You can see the very beginnings of the seeds starting to grow. Jerea canescens can produce flower porn. And this was, this was, is a place called Las Playas. Uh, no, uh, Las Playas. Uh, it's on the Barry Goldwater Range. And you, you can't get there uh, because it's in an active range. But uh, I went out there with archeologists and it was a year when I have never seen anything like that. It was endless. You can see it going over the horizon, this huge stand of Jiria. Okay, fiddle necks are, um, something that I get asked about a lot. And there are two species in this area and they're not all that easy to tell apart. The first one is Amsinchia intermedia. This is in the borage family and borages tend to have that, what's called a scorpioid sign. It's like a scorpion tail, like um, Phacelias have. And um, the scorpion tail kind of unfurls 
as the flowering process continues during the season. So the last flower to flower is on the very end of the tail. Um, this Amsinchia intermedia is not, the, the two species, this is the first one I'm showing, is not all that easy to tell apart when they're just in flower and you're looking at them. The way, one way to tell them apart is that this species have has five calyx lobes and you can see in the lower right um, that the calyx is split into five pieces and those pieces are split all the way to the bottom. And also the di another difference, but you often don't see this when you're standing there looking at it in the field, the seeds are quite different between Amsinchia intermedia and the next species we'll take a look at. You can see these species are kind of rough and bumpy. Um, and the next species we'll look at is bristly fiddle neck, same family again, Amsinchia tessellata. This one um, can be a more robust, can have wider leaves, but that's not a really diagnostic character. What you really need to look at are the calyces again. And on the lower right, there's an example of, of a, a calyx and two of the calyx lobes are fused. Sometimes all you see are three lobes, uh, but there's, there's um, fewer than five. Also the Amsinchia tessellata, when the flower stalk is young uh, and not unfurled much at all, these big broad leaves subtend or are underneath the, the beginning inflorescence. Yeah. But diagnostic are the seeds. And you can see the difference between the intermediate seeds that we saw on the last slide. And these, these seeds are sculpted, but not um, rough or, or uh, bumpy. These are different. You can see the difference right away. It's a little frustrating because you want to know what they are in the field, but it, yeah. So use the kale seeds. Prailing windmills is one of um, visitors' favorites because it's so, the, the pink is so pretty. And oftentimes you see masses of it, especially along roadsides. It loves the roadsides. Um, and what you're looking at here in the upper right, what you see are really not one flower, but three flowers. The Nick Paginaceae, this, that's the family this is in, um, tend to have cups or, or um, these bracts underneath the flowers here. Can you see my cursor? Yes. Um, these bracts under the flowers and that contains these three flowers and I picked them apart and you can see in the scan on the lower right, those are the three flowers. And each of those will produce seeds. Okay, and that's what the seeds look like. They have, uh, they have the main seed body and then surrounding that seed body is kind of a flat part of the seed and it has teeth on it. And when that part gets wetted, the, the tooth part kind of unfurls and exposes these, um, you can see on the right slide, you see those spherical bumps? Those turn into a glue-like substance that will glue the seed to the soil surface. Um, I was just helping with a community project here in my neighborhood and I ripped up a bunch of, of windmills and all these seeds were pasted to the pavement surface. It was really cool to see. Isn't that a neat adaptation? Okay, Steve's pincushion cactus is another species in the Asteraceae, but it doesn't have ray flowers and disc flowers like um, the sunflower did, but it, it, all of its flowers are the same. So, or, more or less the same. 
Um, and this species has leaves that are finely divided and kind of thread-like, but it's very common and it's one of the species that will last well into April. It's real uh, heat tolerant. Coulter's globe mallow is an annual globe mallow. So it's not one of the perennial ones. It's an annual one and depends on the winter rains. It will produce big showy stands, sometimes acres and acres and acres. It looks like, um, it grows like you see in the lower right. One of the, the characters is that the stems are red and they have these kind of star shaped hairs on the on the stem and the flowers have a kind of a yellowish center and are bright orange uh, on the outside of the petals this is what the um uh, this is this is the middle rio sonoita one year when they got really heavy rains and this is uh the globe mallow when in the spring when they were, my husband um, surveys for Sonoran pronghorn in Mexico and they do it by air. And that's why I got all these uh, aerial photography, aerial photographs. Anyway, it's spectacular. Indian wheat is called Indian wheat because it was a really important crop for the Native Americans. Um, it produces a lot of seeds, and you can see there's two different species, Plantago obeta and Plantago patagonica. The obeta has slightly different seeds than patagonica. Obeta has uh, kind of seeds that are silvery on the one side with a kind of a tannish or orange brownish dot in the middle. The Patagonica seeds are larger and, um, and all, all brown on the one side. But the space on the other side, kind of they're seeds, these kind of seeds are called boat shaped seeds. And if you imagine the solid colored side of the seed being the side that goes in the water and you're sitting in that um, in the boat that empty space there where you would sit would capture air and keep the seed afloat in water if it's turned upside down it'll capture air and that's what that's why they're designed that way so they can get carried away on the sheet flow um, Plantago obeta, you can tell because if you look, uh, you can tell the difference between these two species because Plantago patagonica always has these bracts under the flower, like you see in the upper right central um, photograph. It has these long bracts under in each of each of the flowers, and Plantago obeta does not have those bracts. There's other sub, more subtle differences, but those bracts are diagnostic. Okay, perennials. So there are perennial, spring perennials that produce really big shows. And um, we, we'll take them. We'll, we love them all. <laughs> Brittle bush is a perennial uh, shrub. We call them sub shrubs. And it's a, one of the typical kinds of aster flowers with the disc flowers in the center and the ray flowers on the outside. Sometimes the disc flowers are yellow or gold and other times they're darker, they're darker colored. Um, that, they used to be split into subspecies, but now they're, I think they're, they've been um, merged, but they can produce really beautiful displays, brittle bush. Desert globe mallow is in the hibiscus family, the Malvaceae. This one is called Spherosia ambigua, and it was probably called ambigua because not even scientists can really define this species. <laughs> it's very ambiguous. Um, 
some, uh, most of the time, the flowers are this brilliant, rich orange all the way down to the center. And uh, occasionally, and sometimes in certain areas, you get all different kinds of colors. You'll get this kind of a pale lilac. You can get rose or wine or uh, all different colors. You can see that in the Waterman Mountains. There, that's a place where, at least in the limestone areas, you get a lot of different colors. But it produces this kind of bushel basket of, of uh, branches with these gorgeous orange flowers on. The flowers close at night and don't open until um, the next morning. So if you want really pretty photographs of this species, you have to wait until kind of midday. Chupa rosa is a, another shrub. It's a mid-sized shrub. Uh, much of the year, it doesn't have any leaves, but in the springtime, especially when it's producing new shoots, sometimes in the summer, when it's producing new shoots, it does have leaves. Uh, it was When I first moved to the desert, it was one of the most frustrating things about trying to identify this species was that all the descriptions of it said it had no leaf, but it does. And um, you just have to understand that it sometimes has leaves, but sometimes does not. Um, if, of course, it, all you need to do is look at the flowers to know that they're pollinated by hummingbirds. And during the migration season in the spring, certain hummingbirds will, um, oh, it's um, rufous hummingbirds. Are, they're really, kind of aggressive little birds, and they will own particular plants that are in full bloom, and they will defend that plant against any other hummingbird that comes in and tries to feed on it. So they get really territorial. It's kind of fun to watch. If you walk up to one of their plants, they will ask you what you're doing there. Oh, I can't hear Susie. Okay. Mariposa lily, I was asked to include this and I was a good girl and I did. Mariposa lily, uh, Calicortis hennedii. Um, the lily ACE was kind of exploded into, into different families and this one stayed in the lily family. Calicortis hennedii can be yellow and it can also be orange. In organ pipe, we had orange color up in bull pasture most of the stuff that I've seen in the Tucson area has been yellow, but I know there's orange here also. The, you can see in the upper left photograph, the, the, um, the anthers or the male part of the flower are purple or mauve colored. Um, and here's a scan of those. Oh, well, this is a scan of the petal showing this nectar gland that's in down deep in the flower. So the pollinators will go down there to get the uh, nectar and they um, get swept by these hairs that are on the petal. It's really kind of almost creepy looking. It's almost uh, kind of marine, isn't it? To some coral. All right, stop it, Sue. Harry's penstemon is a very showy uh, plant and often you see it along the roadsides, but um, it can be common along the roadsides and less so in wildlands. Penstemon perii is one of many penstemons in Arizona. This is the one though that is most common in the, in the low desert situations. It's got beautiful pink flowers and the the leaves along the flower stalk are rather narrow. Um, if you're in the low desert, this is probably what you're seeing. But the hummingbirds love to uh, visit these flowers. Okay, early on we were talking about blue dicks. This is in the asparagaceae, and its name is Dicolostoma. Capitatum, blue dicks. 
its scientific name has changed uh, a few times. This is what it is now. It can be uh, kind of a, a rose color, pale lavender, bluish, purplish, but this long flower stem arises from a bulb that's deep underground. And uh, there are a, a few leaves that are grooved and the, the seeds are dark black and shiny, but mixed in with the other flowers, it's, it's really lovely. Okay, yellow evening primrose. I love all primroses, so, um, so this is a cool one. Enothera primaveris, yellow evening primrose, is in the Anagraceae evening primrose family. And primrose, uh, or the things in this family have four petals. Um, and th things in the genus Enothera have stigmas, or the, the female part of the flower has four parts to it. And um, Enothera was split from Camasonia because Camasonias have stigmas that are, have, are they have balls. They're, ball, they're spherically shaped. This has a cross. Um, it's low to the ground. It has a rosette of leaves. Sometimes they're speckled and sometimes they're not. The lower left of your screen shows the green fruits, and those fruits op start opening by a pore at the very end, and you can see that on those green fruits, and then uh, slowly open to reveal some pretty nifty looking seeds. They look like little lemons, tiny little lemons, about a millimeter in size. When they're done opening and all the seeds are gone, the, the, the fruit kind of gets woody and hard and dries up. And it looks like what you see in the center, lower center of your uh, screen. Um, so I, I bet you a million dollars you've seen this when you've been walking around in the desert and wondered what it was. Well, it's an old e yellow evening primrose that where the fruit is still still there. It could stub your toe pretty bad if you're wearing sandals. Okay, desert marigold is a common thing along the roadsides. Uh, it has, most of its leaves are in the lower part of the plant and they're kind of woolly like you see in the lower left part of your screen. Another member of the Asteraceae that has both disc flowers, the ones in the middle, and ray flowers, the one on the outside. This is Balea multiradiata. There are several species of Balea in Southern Arizona. Most of them though are, the, the other ones you'll find on, in the Western deserts and sand dunes. So, um, you don't have to worry too much about identifying this one. If you see it in the Tucson area, this is what you're seeing, Balea multiradiata, desert marigold. I've seen this thing blooming every single month, but it really does um, like the spring. Room rape is a really strange plant. Uh, it's holoparasitic, entirely a parasitic on plants in the sunflower family. What that means is that um, these, the, these plants, the broom rape plants are attached to the roots of plants in the aster family. And that could be anything like a, um, a, a triangle leaf bursage. It could attach, it attaches to the roots and gets food and water from the host plant. And this is what it looks like when it's in flower. It sends its flower stock up. Oftentimes I see it in sandy spots like this. And it's got this purplish, purplish flower. Again, like um, owl's clover, 
It's in the Orobankaceae. Many of the species in this family are parasitic in some ways, in some way. Okay, at the end of the season, we've got blue palaverde, and when it goes in flat, and when it starts to flower, it is spectacular. The, the washes are lined with this species, Parkinsonia florida. They turn this brilliant, rich yellow, as opposed to the other um, Palo Verde that we have in this area, the Foothills Palo Verde. It has a, a less brilliant, um, not as bright yellow of a flower. Also, Parkinsonia microphylla, the Foothills Palo Verde, um, blooms a little later, so there's not total overlap between the two species. Okay, I think that's the last one. And then what I want to do is introduce you to the, um, the new part of the Arizona Native Plant Society website that uh, I've loaded some images up onto and they can help you identify some of these wildflowers that we've looked at today. If you go to the Native Plant Society website and you go to the tab, you see the tab and um, several tabs along the lower part of your screen. And one of them says the plants. Um, if you click on that tab, you turn up this web page, and it's the Sue Rutman Plant Identification Guides. And they contain, if you, if you scroll down this page, I don't think I included the lower part of this page. But uh, if you scroll down, you'll see a list of families and uh, you can click on those families and look at all the plants that I have produced identification guides so far. Um, or you can also search for uh, a scientific name or part of an, a scientific name. The site also contains information on how I do these scans if you want to try to do it yourself. Um, it's not all that easy and not, it's very time consuming. <laughs> I'll just say that it's fun and it's wonderful. And I've learned an awful lot. So that's why I want other people to explore it and see what they can see too. Anyway, this is the web page, and you, you go to this um, page and you select a family and you can turn up several species in this family and you can look at them and compare them. These are two species that we looked at today. One is, well, yeah, one is Balea multiradiata on the left, and the other is Justicia californica or Chuparosa on the right. And it gives you scans and photographs of the plant so you know what it, the whole thing looks like. And also there's scales. Uh, there's a scale on the left side that's in millimeters. And so you can see how big or small it is. Sometimes that's hard to tell when you're just looking at a photograph, it's hard to tell what the size is. So um, there are 600 species loaded so far on this website. I think there's almost a hundred grasses. And um, I suspect that a lot of people are gonna be leaning on that, on that grass. Um, those grass guides pretty heavily. It's it's it was a it's a cool project. It's still going on. I'm still working on it. I have a lot of grasses still to do. I have a lot of other species still to do. So, um, you know, I'll probably die doing this. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to make sure you knew this was available. Go to the Native Plant Society website. Go to this web page, and you can download. They're all free. Um, they're all about three to five megabytes a page. You can store them all. You can put them on your iPad and take it out in the field with you. Okay, so now here's the part of the show where we all get to share our favorite wildflower spot. Um, and I think Susie's going to help us um, mediate any of your responses, but I'd like to hear from you guys. I'm fairly new in the Tucson area. I've only lived here uh, several years. Um, I already found some kind of spots, but I'd like to know if anybody else has some kind of neat spots. 
So if you know of a spot, enter it in the chat box and um, Susie or Lynn or I will respond. And let me just jump in and tell you that you really need to go to the website and look at those amazing images. You will, uh, not only are they incredibly useful in terms of identifying what you've got, but they're incredibly beautiful. And Sue has talked about, you know, seed textures and stuff in her presentation, but you can see all these details that you don't see in the field. And it's just, it's a gas. So check it out. It's neat. You know, when you look at a herbarium specimen, you're looking at this dead, dry, gray thing. Um, it's neat to see all these details just sitting in front of your computer and not looking through a microscope, but just sitting in front of your computer and seeing it in true live color. It's, it's, it's really astounding. It's really cool. Um, Thank you, Sue. Sue. Easy. Take it over. Oh. Well, can you tell us what this really cute little flower is that we're looking at in the middle of the screen there? Oh. Um, the white and yellow one. Peridoli emerii. It's a little annual that is it's pretty common in Western Pima County. Oh, it's so cute. What was the first word? Peridoli, P-E-R-I-T-Y-L-E. It's a common name, Emery's Rock Daisy. Thank you. King's Canyon has a few right now. I photograph 31 species along one mile of the stream bed. Wow. Thanks, Jillian. And somebody says, uh, wildflower peeping. Are you peeping? <laughs> along the Camino del Diablo. Well, that surprises me. Uh, where is that? for those of you who don't know the Camino del Diablo is the road that goes east west and vice versa across the um, Cabeza Prieta National Wildlife Refuge mm -hmm. in west in Yuma County. Okay. So everybody that's out there, please put on the on the uh, chat, the places that you've gone, not just this year, because we know this year is not the best, but in the past, places where you've just had a jackpot. And so then it says orange and yellow um, calicordus in Catalina State Park. I don't know if they're there this year, but I have seen both the orange and the yellow in Catalina. Yeah, so have I. Uh, also in Saguaro Park East. So uh, Pinal, Pinal Marlin, Merlin is saying uh, orange and white mariposas in Sonora, in uh, Saguaro National Park East in good years. The white mariposa is a different species. Uh, uh, what's the species? Uh, I'm trying to think of it. Jack, if you know, help me out. But... Um, it's more common in in upper in higher in mid to higher elevation. So in the grasslands, for example, it's it's um, a nice surprise and can be common in certain areas, especially so, limestone grasslands, like in the Sonoita area. Sue, why don't you stop sharing your screen so we can have a view of people. And if people want to unmute and maybe even, oh my God, show their faces, that would be so exciting. Thanks, Sue. That was great. Wonderful. Oh, good. Thanks, Ken. Still loving Keep your arm. attitude. Keep it up, girl. It's great. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> Keep going. Yes. You know, one of the places that, that I go um, to look at wildflowers is in the, in the um, Santa Rita's uh, west of Box Canyon. If you west of Box Canyon, there's some granite in there and there's some washes that are sandy gravelly and you get some kind of neat stuff in there 
Garden oh, Canyon is good too. Garden <clears throat> Canyon? Garden Canyon, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a good name for it. <laughs> uh, it Lily, Lily and Parii in the Santa Rita's. In the Santa Rita's, yep. Lily and Parii. Some beautiful stands actually where the springs. Yeah, and I've seen some uh, nice little orchids that uh, adder's mouth orchid up there along the Cary Nation Trail, more in the summer though, I think, rather than spring, but uh, yeah, down in the Santa Rita's. Yeah, but the east of Box Canyon, you'll get Sonoran Desert wildflowers um, this time of year. Okay. Uh, and a, a lot of times along the, the washes, if the cows haven't pounded the area yet, flowers. <laughs> really too bad that Catalina isn't good this year because I, in past years, and I don't have a long history, but Catalina has been really nice in past years. Mm -hmm. Sort of the old standards, but still fun. The Waterman Mountains are, are, are really neat because that limestone does weird things to, to flower colors. Uh, the Phacelia ambigua in there is this, um, usually Phacelia ambigua is, is bluish purple, but there it's almost magenta. It's, it's a different color. Okay, does anybody else have um, a favorite place? And you can also put up that little hand symbol. Yeah, type in stuff you know, and we're gonna, we'll capture the chat and sort of sort them out and make a list and we'll put it up on the website so you can uh, consult it this year or in years to come as places. You know, you know, I was just thinking that it would be nice to have uh, on like the Facebook um, site for the Arizona Native Plant Society. Can people post photos of from wildflower trips that they've taken? I actually don't. I think that the posting ability is limited on that website just sort of to keep keep it. Yeah, though that would be a really good way to share current information. I love that kind of stuff where I can see what people are seeing and then I zip out and try to see it myself. <laughs> it oh yeah, you know, somebody somebody is noting that um, the first three miles of the Ruby Road in past years has yellow and white poppies. Um, Tubac has some, but I've seen it also along the road to Aravaca, kind of, sort of near, more near the highway than not. There's a diversity of colors in there from white to um, darker orange. Um, that area can also be tricky because if you don't look closely, you'll miss the calcortis that are actually kind of interspersed around the edges of some of those poppy fields. So I've had to pull off just around Aravaca Lake and you're kind of like, that's a really different color poppy. And then you get a little closer and find out it wasn't a poppy at all. It's just kind of blending in. Cool. Deb Sparrow, did, was there something that you wanted to say? Oh, just, um, I, I wonder about, I mean, I love sharing stuff, but I also get worried about um, there's there's a spot I go to that I'm very careful who I share with, uh, and I don't and it doesn't have a name and doesn't have a trailhead, so I can't even tell you guys about it, and it's not in Tucson. So, but don't I, we I, all have those spots? Yeah, and, and the little, but I think in terms of Facebook sharing, um, if mm -hmm. they were going to do Facebook sharing, it would be good to have some. Um, you know, some advice or something on it to, to remind people of that issue. Um, I don't I, know. Really good comment. I think we do need to, um, you know, 
be circumspect at some level. And some of the places like trails in the national parks are going to be obvious. Yeah. If, if there's a if there's a parking lot there, I mean, you know. <laughs> but, no, but, but you um, know, a couple of years ago they had that super bloom in Southern California and yeah. be a real problem because there were so many people coming out that they trample all these forests. And John Turing, the folks on the barments are having that issue where the, the Turks cap is there and it could be um, it could be taken and you the thing is you can't you can't protect it if you don't know that it's there and yet um, you know so uh, um, I don't know what the right way to use social media is it seems like an ongoing discussion probably um, but I, I'm I'm dying to go wandering with all of you in your special spots, so I'll tell you. <laughs> I, I'm up here in Tempe, so it doesn't happen all the time. <laughs> well, it would be nice to figure out a way we could do it. And I'm not sure Facebook, which is so easily accessible, is the best choice. One possibility could be um, something on the web page that would be something that you'd really have to search you know, you'd have to know that you were looking for it and you'd find it on the ACNPS webpage. That might be a possibility where it wouldn't be quite so open to you know, mass consumption. But we, we should give some thought to that. I mean, obviously it changes year to year too. Um, in the past, the Desert Museum has maintained pages about, you know, the flowering in a given year. I don't know if they do that anymore, but... Um, yeah, it's a reason why we should all talk to each other all the time. And come <laughs> well, looking on the chat some more, and Lynn, will you be able, then you'll be able to capture this chat before we sign off? Yes, I'm actually copying it as it happens. Oh, okay. We also get it on the recording. So, okay. but double, double, double duty, I'm checking. Uh, I'm, I'm copying it as it comes up, so, yes. Yeah, there's a message about King's Canyon from Jillian. I got and, it. And I guess, Jillian, were you down in the stream then? It says along the stream, Dad. Yes, I, so, yeah, you know, the trail, there's, it, it sort of forks right when you leave the parking area. Mm -hmm. And I took the lower fork that goes, oh. and you actually can walk right along the stream bed. And, and there is, some really gorgeous stuff. Uh, that that centuria, I forget the name now. It it changed to, to a totally different genus name, but oh, it has a pink. Pardon? Yeah, it used to be centarium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that pink flowered star shaped thing. Um Zelt there were Nera. there was it, one it, magnificent. It went, to, it went to the genus Zeltnera. Z yeah, Zeltnera, that's right. Um yeah. <clears throat> So anyway, that that there was at least one spectacular plant of that in a, in one little wetter spot. You know, there there's there were actually little teeny weeny pools of water here and there along that stream bed with some aquatic beetles and whatnot there. A lot of uh, yellow monkey flowers, and if you looked really closely, you could find some of the little stuff too. And um, so, so I found 31 species of, of uh, wildflowers in bloom along that stream bed in just one mile. So, oh, wow. It, but as I say, you have to look pretty close for some of them. Some of them are little, <laughs> but, um, but there were some really pretty things out there that day. And that was just about a week ago that I was there, so. Great. Are, are people finding um, uh, it, it, the timing of, of wildflowers this year? Are you finding things? You've got a feeling of how much it seems to be quite a bit late here uh, uh, up in these parts. And I'm, is there something predictable about, about how they're appearing for you guys? I, th I think part of it is that they're quite small this year, so we're not noticing. But yeah. Yeah, I think they, they might be like a week, week, or maybe too late. Uh, they it seemed that I, I know organ pipe the best, and it seemed like they were a, a little bit late. But you know, one of the things that I, I should mention is that 
the sand dunes of uh, the Gran Desierto and the Pinacate are fantastic. Uh, you find all sorts of weird sand dune endemics down there. And I just love that area. Yeah, it's an effort to get there, but it's it's drop dead gorgeous if you're there and at, at the right time in a good year. Yeah. There's a, there are some dunes that are only like 20 miles south of Sanoita along the road. Um, and if you walk over to those dunes, you can explore all you want and um, see all these weird endemic things. Aren't we lucky to live in this wonderful place? We are. Yeah. I have to tell you, the, the, um, the Sonoran Symposium is every two years in Ajo at the conference center. And it's a fantastic, I, I'd love to promote it because it's a fantastic place where people who love the desert get together and share this love. and. Um, and all the information exchange that happens with cultural and natural resources. It's a tri-national symposium. So the Mexicans, the autumn and um, uh, the rest of us are involved and it's truly tri-national. It's a wonderful symposium. If you get a chance to go to it in two years, do it. And there's field trips involved too. So you get to go to all these really cool places in Western Pima County and in Mexico. I'm kicking myself for that it's two years. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I missed that too. Well, I have um, captured the chat that we see so far, but we're also recording this and recording. Um, thank you so much, Sue, for such a great talk with so much information embedded in all these gorgeous flowers. You're and welcome. We are so really honored to be able to have your images up on the website. They are going to be really, really useful to lots of people, not just the ones of us that are sitting here, but lots of people are going to find them. And we will support you in every way we can so that you keep making those things until you can't make them anymore. Die. <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you to all of you for joining us. This was a great um, sort of replacement for the flower season that is, well, we're seeing that it's so spotty, but um, but it's always great, even if, even if it's flower porn, we love it. And <laughs> <laughs> we really appreciate your efforts, and we hope you can get a nice rest after five talks this week. That's right. And we'll be sending out some more information about the City Nature Challenge and about other field trips as we are able to um, put them together. Get out and look at the plants. They're out there. You have to look closely sometimes, but they are there. So thank you all for coming. Exciting. Thank you, Sue, you for the introduction. And we'll see you in a month when we have another great talk about audacious butterflies in <laughs> all right okay thanks, Sue. have a great end of the month folks bye-bye thanks Bye. Sue. that was incredible oh thanks